Hello, my name is Winnie Sullivan, and on behalf of the History Committee of the Parish Racial Equity Review Team, I welcome you to this introductory presentation on the racial history of College Church. For the past several months, our parish has been engaged in a racial equity review, the purpose of which is to appraise every aspect of our parish life, to identify how systemic racism has been preserved, to dismantle those structures and to replace them with ones that are equitable. Well, why do we need to do this? As you are undoubtedly aware, the history of our parish is complex. That just as we have had over the years voices raised in resistance to racism, the very founding of the parish relied on the exploited labor of enslaved people. So our racial equity review has been undertaken to help us acknowledge some painful facts, to learn about those instances of resistance and to be moved to act in ways that bring about change. To accomplish this, members of our parish formed a review team and called upon the Crossroads Anti-Racism and Training Organization to guide our efforts. Our first task was to take a deep dive into our parish history, to consider how that history influences us today and how it directs us toward the goal of racial equity. So I and members of our history committee, Carl Greiner, Mary White, Emery Weber, Dave Werthman, and Father Dan, want to share with you some of what we've learned and we want to whet your appetite to learn more. Now I'd like to ask Father Dan to lead us in an opening prayer and to help center our historical exploration in our parish vision. Thank you, Winnie. Our faith is rooted in an understanding of salvation history. If we go back through the scriptures in the tradition of who we are as people of faith, time and again, we encounter the God who is at work in history. And the scriptures and our church tradition is filled with the grace of God at work and also the unwillingness of God's people to act upon that grace. Salvation history is always a mixed bag of God's great generosity and our unwillingness to respond well to that generosity. Our parish history is no different. Our parish racial history is certainly rooted in this experience of participation in great evil, but also resistance and grace poured out by the Holy Spirit. Our parish vision is to be a place of great understanding of how God is at work in and through us. And the work of anti-racism is dedicated to recognizing where we have participated in this great sin and evil, how we have resisted, and how going forward we, may, we might create a parish community based on racial justice and racial equity. And so I invite you to listen and pray and contemplate as we go forward sharing our history, because it is the history of us as a people and God's grace, our sinfulness, and our own redemption. So let us pray. Lord, we know racism is a sin and spiritual disorder that has taken root in the garden of our souls. We pray for your grace to convert us through the Holy Spirit so that we can walk by faith toward justice, hope, love, and healing for the greater glory of your kingdom. We ask the Holy Spirit to enter our lives, change our hearts, and allow us to see what we'd rather not see. Lord, we ask that you bless us as we go on this journey and that we may be grounded and rooted in your word. Amen. Thank you, Father Dan. Now Carl is going to help us consider this question. Why do we examine our history? Thank you, Winnie. As we talk about our history, I cannot help but be drawn to the image of messiness. 
There is a certain sense of structure, orderliness, grace, and beauty that we are brought up to desire in our church. We see this in our church buildings. We see this in our rubrics for sacraments. Often as I show up for Sunday Mass, I find myself subconsciously expecting to have a set of order to the gathering. Procession, prayers, reading, Eucharist, blessings. It is my own human nature to try to order things. And as we continue in our racial equity review work to become an anti-racist parish, I am drawn to a similar desire for order. During our history project, you will see how we neatly put events and people into rows and columns. There's a sense of having a chronological order to our history. Yet as we have, as we have been putting our history on paper, it is messy. I cannot look to a columnar view of history. In other words, just looking at our city or our state or our parish, there's an intertwining of our history that cannot be undone. There is a relational messiness between events in the world, in our country, our state, city, our diocese and parish, and amongst us as individuals. These thoughts alone can feel overwhelming. Yet we need to look at our history. We need to understand our history through the lenses of civic, religion, communal, and personal. Why, you may ask, let me simply suggest what I find in my own life. I'm often reminded of a simple definition of insanity. That is doing the same thing over and over again, yet expecting a different result. Our history informs our present while carrying us into the future. I find that I continue down a path often without ever considering why I chose this path. I'm grateful to be a member of the parish community and a team that desires something different, something bold. In understanding our history of participation in racism, we can look to the future with eyes wide open. We can bring ourselves individually and communally to a place of reflection, discernment, and intentional action to change, to become an anti-racist parish. We can know ourselves as taken, blessed, broken, and given more deeply and more truly for who we are as Christ's hands and heart here in Midtown St. Louis. We can envision a world that is different from our history. We can seek and identify ways to work to reconcile with our past. How may we ask forgiveness for our harms? How may we be a community where we truly live each day to love all of our neighbors, not just those who look like us, or who think like us? How might we build a new and inclusive future for all? Our history is one of relationships, as is our present and as will be our future. Our history is a way to more deeply know who we are, to look deeply into the mirror so that we can see clearly, individually and communally, who we are and at the same time providing us a space and the opportunity to build new relationships together as a parish and in our community and in our area as the hands and heart of Christ here in Midtown St. Louis. Winnie, back to you. Thank you, Carl. Um, we'd like now to move to a portion of this presentation that we're calling personalizing our history. And you'll see more about what that means in a moment. On the accompanying slide, you'll notice an image of our newly created parish racial history brochure, which we have thanks to the special efforts of two parishioners, Laura Winter and Laura Stanton. 
I hope that those of you who are able to attend mass in person will obtain a copy of the brochure, which will be available in the back of church. The brochure essentially consists of three timelines. As we began looking at our parish history, it immediately became clear that because of the age of our parish, we'd have to look at not just our parish, our parish history, but also our civic history. And by that, we mean important events in the city of St. Louis, the state of Missouri, and the United States. Also the historical developments in the Archdiocese of St. Louis and the history of St. Louis University and the Jesuit order with which our parish history is intimately bound. So those are the categories of history that we've tried to capture on this brochure. And I encourage you to get a copy of it and spend some time absorbing and then reflecting on the information that it contains. One thing we hope is that as you spend time becoming more familiar with our history, it will engage you as it has each of us. Now each member of the committee is going to spend some time sharing how some of the stories that form our history, those of Matilda Tyler and Henrietta Mills, of the ethnic settlement of St. Louis and local parishes, of the integration of St. Louis University, of the Mill Creek Valley, how those stories have affected us and how knowing this history calls us to change personally and as a parish. But we'll start with Emory. We cannot talk about racism in the church or society without without talking about slavery. The effects of slavery have continued to influence American society, institutions, churches, and people even today. It has had a lasting effect on the US Catholic Church, including the Catholic Church in St. Louis. I became aware of slavery on a personal level while researching my ancestors who owned plantations and held black people as slaves in Louisiana. Here is an 1844 estate appraisal with the names and ages of the enslaved. The house was the plantation home of several of my ancestors. These things did not cause me any concern as there was nothing that I did to cause people to be held in bondage. William Valentine de Berg arrived in St. Louis in 1817 as Bishop of the Territory of Louisiana and the Floridas. Moving to New Orleans in 1822, he purchased an enslaved man named Harry, his wife, and their nine children. Their description is in the upper right. In 1827, he sold this family to Bishop Joseph Rosati, the second Bishop of St. Louis, the document in the lower left. This was 200 years ago and did not touch me while providing more information to research. Bishop Joseph Rosati came to St. Louis as the superior of the Vincentians. After receiving land from the people of Perry County, Missouri to build a church and seminary, he purchased a Negro boy named Henry for $225.20 from Cornelius Rhodes in 1821. The bishop and his priests eventually held over 50 enslaved people in bondage. Slavery was a common practice in St. Louis and in many parts of Missouri. Since the bishops, priests, and committees of religious women held people in slavery, it seemed to be sanctioned. I just accepted it. About 14 years ago, I researched the enslaved people bought and owned by Rose Philippine Duchenne and the religious of the Sacred Heart who came to St. Louis in 1818. Bishop Duberg gave an enslaved child named Liza to Mother Duchenne. The sisters soon purchased more people for schools in St. Louis and Louisiana. 
Although Mother Duchen wrote that she did not want slaves, she could not do without them. I saw her reasons for this and agreed that these first religious women could not do all the work necessary to survive and to teach school as well. Matilda Tyler was one of the group of enslaved people brought to St. Louis by the Jews. She worked on their farm and she university. Matilda saved enough money to make two payments of $50 each in 1847 and then $200 by August 1848 to purchase her freedom. The entry in the university ledger states that it is to be appropriated to St. Francis Xavier Church. She received her confirmation and first communion at St. Francis the following year. She and her husband, George Tyler, were able to purchase the freedom of four of their sons. The Sacramental Register of Marriages of St. Francis Xavier College Church recorded that on June 28, 1860, united in the holy bonds of matrimony, Charles Chauvin, slave of Mrs. Curtis, and Henrietta Mills, slave of St. Louis University. Henrietta had received her confirmation and communion in May 1855 at the age of 10 in St. Francis Xavier Church. Many other enslaved people received the sacraments at St. Francis Xavier. In reflecting upon these events of the past, I saw how Matilda Tyler and other enslaved people worked hard and sacrificed much to purchase their freedom. I look at contributions to the social ministry of St. Francis Xavier College Church and see how they are being used for outreach programs to purchase freedom for those held in the bondage of poverty, homelessness, incarceration, or color. I look at the sacramental records of enslaved people who celebrated their marriages or baptisms, confirmations and communions, and ask, how am I celebrating with the black parishioners of St. Francis? Am I talking and singing, praying and rejoicing with them? Are we as a parish doing this, not only here in church, but also in our homes and families, schools and work, in our neighborhoods and daily activities. And now Carl Griner will share his reflections. Thank you, Emery. I think about history and I wonder if some of you like me may have really struggled with history in your, in your formal education. I found history for me to be more of a memorization of dates, you know, knowing key events and names, and for me, just being able to pass that back to pass a test. Kind of with this lens of history, the idea of participating in our parish history review, to be honest, was not something I would have ever foreseen in my life. Yet here I am, grateful to be a member of the history team here as part of our parish racial equity review. And what am I learning through this work? I think I'm learning through this work is, for me personally, I find it helpful to sit and reflect on the history. The history of our parish here in Midtown, the history of the Jesuits, our archdiocese, our city. For me, I need to get out of my head. You know, history to me has always been an intellectual study. And for me, as I think about history and becoming an anti-racist parish, I feel it's more of an interior feeling, something deep inside of me that draws me to, one, a curiosity to learn more, but maybe more so to experience more. And what I'm finding in this history work is it's inviting me to some individual soul searching. As I reflect on becoming an anti-racist parish, I wonder how will this new way of being affect me personally, myself and each of us at this moment, aware of myself 
as a natural instinct drawn to fix problems. Yet in learning about our history of racism, I can feel overwhelmed. The pervasiveness of racism in our city, in our state, in our country, and even today in the current structures is just overwhelming. And just sitting with that, racism is not a problem that I can solve. It's a very, very unsettling feeling. Yet in the midst of this uncertainty and unsettling feeling, I have a growing awareness of the racism in our history and our world today. And a big discerning as well, what, what actions might I be able to take? A few things are, one thing I can do is inform myself. Inform myself that I can share with others. I can learn more about the interrelatedness of our history, the history of racism and the misuse of power and the impacts on humanity. I can choose to be thoughtful and intentional in my actions and my relationships. I can ask what is needed, not assume I know. I can choose to be present with the people God has in my life while also being intentional in deciding and determining who I want to keep in my life and who I may want to invite into my life as well. In listening more fully, I hope I can be open to the challenge of being more vulnerable with my feelings and thoughts, to be present to the marginalized, the oppressed, to people of color, black and brown, and even white who share different views than I do to ask people what they feel they need, not what I want. I can ask to share their stories. I can use my voice as a white male to bring light to the issues of racism in our world today. I can be in relationship with black and white and brown people in working to change our racist and oppressive institution, institutional systems. I struggle, but I do feel drawn to be God's hands and feet, and hopefully his voice in some ways, if this is what God desires of me. I invite you each as you're viewing this video to join in your own individual reflection of our history and see where your journey takes you and how that might lead, it, lead you in our community at St. Francis Xavier College Church. And now let me turn it over to Mary White. Mary? Thank you, Carl. Researching material for the timeline made me realize that many of the events noted occurred during my lifetime. It's as if T.S. Eliot's words, we had the experience but missed the meaning, were written specifically with me in mind. On the lawn between de Berg Hall and the College Church, there stands a historic marker commemorating Father Claude Heithaus, SJ, and the fiery sermon he preached to 500 SLU students on Friday morning, February 11th, 1944. A well-crafted, calculated sermon that catalyzed the integration of St. Louis University. I wanted to know more about the man on the marker, what motivated him, what events precipitated his sermon, why on that particular day, who supported his views, how did he strategize to maximize the impact of his words in challenging the status quo of the university. What personal repercussions followed? Claude Heithaus was born in St. Louis and after ordination studied at the University of London from 1943 to 1940. Earning a doctorate in archeology span and classics. He was a very outspoken man one willing to speak truth to power. 
In a 1973 interview, three years before he died, he recalled doing field work in the backwoods of southern Syria and Lebanon, searching for the remnants of small temples built by non-Romans. During these digs, he worked with and lived among the Arabs and the Druzes in very small rural villages. There, he was sometimes the brunt of extremely hostile receptions, having rocks and stones hurled at him, being spit upon, cursed at by village men and boys at the top of their lungs. As a non-Arab, a hated white man from London speaking English, he quickly realized what it was like to have the wrong complexion. And the memory of this experience stayed with him when he returned to St. Louis in 1940. Allow me to share his words with you. So when I came back to St. Louis and saw what was going on here, I suddenly saw something that I'd never noticed before. Something very similar was being dished out to the Negroes here, similar to what I'd experienced among the people in Southern Syria and Lebanon. It was then that I became interested in the problem. Fortunately for Father Heithaus, there were several Jesuits in St. Louis who were also convinced of the evils of racism. Among them, Father John Marco and his brother, Father William Marco. Both priests had pledged in August of 1917, one month after the East St. Louis race riots, to dedicate themselves to improving the lives of African Americans in the United States. They eventually ministered at St. Elizabeth's Parish and St. Malachy's Parish, two black parishes in the city. And they were active against racial discrimination and injustice all of their lives. Father Claude Heithaus had a particular experience in the rural areas of the Middle East. He did not miss its meaning. He acted on it. Think of that the next time you have the experience of passing by his historic marker. And now I'd like to pass it on to David Worthman. Thank you, Mary. Well, a piece of our parish history that caught my attention was a part of the city known as Mill Creek Valley. I'd heard various descriptions of it and its approximate location made me realize that it was fairly close to the SLU campus. So I became curious about how our parish may have been impacted by it. And I began asking the question, exactly what was Mill Creek Valley? So for starters, it was home to 20,000 people. 95% of them were black. It's where Josephine Baker and Scott Joplin grew up. The photo here looks like a typical neighborhood you would find today in Lafayette Square or perhaps Benton Park. In addition, there were all sorts of businesses, about 800 or so, including grocery stores and bakeries, dry cleaners, a YMCA, there were office buildings with banks and lending institutions, movie theaters, nightclubs, and restaurants. Schools, hospitals, and churches, all the things we take for granted in each of our neighborhoods today. Mill Creek Valley had truly developed a distinct region for African-American culture based on religion, music, and entertainment, as well as a good eye for business. Yet there were also rundown sections of the neighborhood with dilapidated buildings badly in need of repair. Some houses did not always have running water or even in some cases electricity. But instead of fixing up the places that needed help and making life better for those who lived there, 
the mayor and city planners at the time were determined that because of the neighborhood's prime central location, if St. Louis was ever to make any economic progress at all, Mill Creek Valley had to be eradicated. So under the guise of urban renewal, demolition began in 1959 and continued into 1960. Very few of the buildings were spared. In fact, nearly 40 black churches were lost. Now, I was a small child at that time, and I didn't even live in St. Louis back then, but the reality hit me that this happened in my lifetime. This doesn't go back to pre-Civil War days. This was a modern day event. But the main question for our interest at College Church is, where did this all happen? And the answer may shock you. It was right across the street from the front doors of our church building. In this aerial photo, you can see St. Francis Xavier circled in red near the bottom, just off center. Mill Creek Valley was bordered by both Lindell Avenue and Grand Boulevard. Uh, it went south to the railroad tracks that run under the Grand Viaduct. The orange line through the middle of the neighborhood marks Compton Avenue. And the neighborhood actually went down, some sources say to Jefferson, some say to 20th Street. This photo doesn't go that far. Many of these people lived literally at our doorstep. Imagine if the city planners had truly renewed this part of the city instead of destroying it, how different our parish would be today. Recently, I drove through the city of Ferguson and I noted on the population sign, it read 21,000. Well, Mill Creek Valley was only slightly smaller than that. So imagine if the entire city of Ferguson was told they had to get out because everything in their lives was going to be demolished. Well, that's basically what happened to the people living in Mill Creek Valley. Historical memory is essential to the Jewish community so that a repeat of the Holocaust does not occur. For us, knowing our city and our parish's racial history is important so that the blunders of the past are not repeated and so that thousands of lives are not once again upended, especially among our brothers and sisters of color who are the most vulnerable in so many ways. And now I'm giving it back to Winnie Sullivan. Thank you, Dave. So as some of you may know, I have been immersed in conjunction with a book project in the study of Black Catholic history for some years now. So studying our parish history has just continued for me an already very illuminating experience. But aside from just acquiring new knowledge, what has the gathering of these facts of history actually meant? Two things. First, learning this history has given me an ability to place in its proper perspective the Eurocentric church in America that as a lifelong Catholic, I had grown up with and internalized as the church. It has afforded me a better understanding of the universal church and of the true diversity of the church as it exists in the United States. Father Cyprian Davis, who wrote a foundational work on the history of Black Catholics, had the following to say about expanding our historical lens and recognizing the influence of Black Catholics on American Catholicism. He wrote, more than we realize, the history of the Black Catholic community is coextensive with the history of the American Catholic community. What is needed today are historical studies that no longer simply probe the ministry and apostolate to Blacks, but rather focus the spotlight on the Black Catholic community itself to, de to determine its role in the Catholic drama of the last two centuries. He went on to say, true, the history of the Black Catholic community is very small compared to the history of Black America at large, which formed the Black church, Protestant in its affiliation and its creed, uniquely African in its ethos and its celebration. The heroes of Black people in this country are Black pastors and Black prophets. 
Alongside this now glorious tradition, the story of the small group of black Catholics that clung proudly and even at times desperately to its Roman and universalist traditions, to its saints, its pastors, and its religious sisters seems perhaps insignificant. They were the minority that was ministered to, but seemingly did not minister, that was preached to, but did not preach, that was provided for, but did not provide. And yet without that black Catholic community, American Catholicism would not have the characteristics it has today. To know that black Catholics were here in this country before the country's founding has been profoundly meaningful for me. African captives brought from the Congo, an area colonized by the Portuguese, were Catholic when they arrived here. Historians have argued that it was enslaved Congolese Catholics who rose up in defiance in the South Carolina colony in 1739 launching what we now know as the Stono Rebellion, the largest slave uprising in the British colonies before the Revolutionary War. And there in the middle of that slide, you see a, a marker for the Stono Rebellion. It has been important to know about Esteban Dorantes, the first black Catholic who emerges on the American scene, who was the advanced scout for the first expedition of the Spanish Franciscan missionary Fra Marcos de Niza into the American Southwest in 1539. Esteban, who's pictured there on the right of that slide, was killed on that expedition, but without him, Fra Marcos would not have found his way to what he thought were the cities of gold. It has been important to know about Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable, French in language, Catholic in religion, suspect to the British, and friend of the Potawatomi Indians. A seemingly devout man who cared enough about his religion to go to great lengths to have his marriage to a Native American woman blessed by a priest. Gusabel, who established his training post on the site of the future city of Chicago, which is my home, is buried in a Catholic cemetery in St. Charles, Missouri. And then to know that Black Catholics have been in St. Louis since at least the time of the city's founding provides me with an enlightened understanding of the universality of the church and specifically of American Catholicism. The second way in which this learning of history has meaning for me is the active imagination that I engage in each time I learn a new fact. When I look at an image of Matilda Tyler, I know that I am Matilda. Had I lived then, I would have shared her experience, helping to build this church. When I think about worshiping in the gallery of College Church, the first college church, I know that had I lived then, that's where I would have been. When I think about parishioners at St. At, at Elizabeth's, I'm one of them experiencing not only the segregation of the institutional church, but the resiliency, vibrancy, and faithfulness of those parishioners. And when I learn about the students being admitted to SLU in 1944, I know that I'm one of them, living their experience of being the first to integrate the university with all that that entails. I also acknowledge my debt to them because without their courage, I may not have been able to attend graduate school at SLU. So as I reflect on this history, I think about where we are now and realize we've come a long way, but we have a long way yet to go. And I feel encouraged, hopeful, and committed. Um, I'll now ask Father Dan to uh, pick up the thread and uh, he'll help us conclude this portion of our presentation. Thank you, Winnie. Uh, I hope and I pray that all of you, uh, having now just had a small taste of the work and the labors of all who have contributed to this history project, uh, have a better understanding of uh, the 
struggles and challenges and frankly the sinfulness that have been part of our faith community but also the great grace that has been poured out the great uh, sense of uh, god still at work uh, god is faithful to us even in the midst of our weakness and sinfulness and that great uh, grace has been poured in abundance upon our work and upon our history Every time we gather uh, to celebrate Mass, we pray in the Eucharistic prayer the words of Jesus, do this in memory of me. That idea is that in calling to mind that one action of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, we are making present that reality in the here and now that memory and history uh, for Catholics is not simply knowing about the past, but that that action of Jesus is made present to us now. That knowing our history isn't simply good and important, but that being immersed in the memory of Jesus Christ and his actions and therefore in the church that he founded means that memory and history are in our Catholic DNA. This is not an add on to our faith, this is our faith. And so this is essential for us as a people, as a community, as St. Francis Xavier College Church, to be aware of what has taken place so that here in the present, we can know both our weakness and sinfulness, and yet know that as St. Ignatius says, we are sinners called to love and serve the Lord. Many of our um, speakers today have spoken of those who have been shining examples. Uh, Paul would call them the great cloud of witnesses that have helped us in our faith as a community. And in so doing that, they have also pointed us in the direction of our future. That we are called rooted and grounded in our history and in the memory of that history, that we can go forward seeking justice, seeking reconciliation, seeking healing, uh, because we know where we have been and how God has been with us even in the midst of great suffering and great challenge. Do this in memory of me. That is what unites us in the Eucharist. And what unites us as a community is that shared memory. Knowing both the good and knowing the bad as well. Knowing the graces and knowing our unwillingness to receive and use those graces. We are called to remember, to be people of memory, so that we can be the people that Christ has called us to be as a community. Thank you. Winnie? Thank you, Father Dan. In the coming weeks, we'll have additional opportunities to learn about our parish history. This year during Lent, we're again blessed to have available our Lenten Racial Justice Journey, a collection of articles, videos, and podcasts on the theme of racial justice designed to enrich our Lenten experience. Among the articles will be some that provide more detail about our history. To deepen that experience, there will also be the opportunity to take part in the spiritual conversations small group discussions about the racial justice journey materials. Then later this spring, late March or early April, we'll be offering a more comprehensive presentation uh, with visual aids to accompany that. So again, thank you for joining us. We hope that this introduction to our history invites you to explore it more thoroughly and to consider what it is calling you to do. Thank you.